Hello, and welcome to Virtual Coast Fest 2020. I'm Charlie Matters, an 11th grader at Brunswick High School. Here in our studio today, I'm joined by my dad, Paul, and Cameron. And today, we're diving into artificial reefs. Thank you, Charlie. I'm Paul Metters, a marine biologist with the Coastal Resources Division, and I've been with the DNR for 26 years. And part of my job is to manage the work unit that does the, builds the artificial reefs and oyster habitat restoration, and also is responsible for public access. And I'm Cameron Britton, a marine biologist with the Coastal Resources Division. I've been here for three years working with Paul to help build artificial reefs. And we'd like to show you a short video on what we do every day for DNR. We'll be back to answer your questions via YouTube and Facebook afterwards. Georgia's marine fish play an essential role in keeping the ecosystems of our state's inshore and offshore ocean habitats healthy. That's why the Coastal Resources Division of the Georgia Department of Natural Resources does our best to make sure fish have a place to thrive. Many types of fish all over the world live in special ecosystems called reefs. You may have heard of Australia's Great Barrier Reef or Graves Reef right off the coast of Georgia. These are natural reefs formed as marine life like corals and sea fans cling to hard surfaces and rock formations, or even the hardened remains of previous corals. Georgia's coastline is made up of sand, shell, and mud. The underwater landscape looks much like what you see at the beach at low tide. This sandy bottom stretches for many miles out to the continental shelf edge. There are not really many places for fish to hide in a flat, open environment like this. They need a protected space to feed and spawn. That's where the Coastal Resources Division comes in with something called an artificial reef. An artificial reef mimics natural formations like the Great Barrier Reef and Graves Reef to provide fish with a place to live in areas where they might not have otherwise been able to. In order to build an artificial reef, we provide structures where fish can hide from predators and will attract other types of marine life into the neighborhood. And while the structure itself is man-made or artificial, the reef that forms from this formation is totally natural. Big chunks of rocks and even steel and concrete are obvious materials to build reef foundations. But did you know we've also made reefs out of surplus army tanks, old metal bridges, and retired ships? Almost any substantial surface that is clean, free from toxins, and won't trap animals can be used. Fish can find their new home here right away. And within a year, encrusting organisms like coral and algaes and barnacles will attract themselves to these surfaces. Sea turtles love these new hiding places. After a time, the reef will create its own self-sustaining ecosystem where every organism plays a role in the food chain. Artificial reefs in Georgia's inshore marshes are similar, but instead of being located far out to the ocean, they can be found in our tidal creeks and rivers. They can enhance areas that lack suitable habitat for fish and provide increased recreational fishing opportunities. While offshore, Coastal Resources Division may create reefs from large items like ships, the inshore reefs are made from smaller materials. Concrete structures like fish aggregation devices, such as reef balls, have been placed all across Georgia's inshore coastline to promote healthy fish habitat. Inshore artificial reefs not only provide habitat for fish, but for oysters as well. Oysters are known as a keystone species. This means that oysters are so important to habitat that if they're taken away, the entire ecosystem would stop working. As filter feeders, oysters are able to filter out man-made pollutants and naturally occurring bacteria. Oysters have the ability to clean about two and a half gallons of water every hour, making their job very important. Oysters prefer to build their mounds upon their own shells. So while surfaces like rocks and concrete make great inshore fish habitat, we often choose to recycle discarded oyster shells back into the ecosystem. Oyster shells can be used to restore and enhance oyster reefs. To rehabilitate an oyster reef, oyster shells are collected together in net bags so they can be handled. These bags of oyster shells are placed along the edge of a tidal creek as new oysters grow on the old ones. The mounds grow as they mature into adults. The revitalized mounds help protect the shoreline by acting as a buffer against wave action along the creek. The healthy reef will also provide additional fish habitat. Building homes for fish is an essential part of maintaining a healthy inshore marsh system and a healthy habitat along Georgia's coast. We hope you've enjoyed learning about the inshore and offshore reef program. All right, welcome back to the Coast Fest studio. Paul and Cameron are ready to take any questions you may have about their program. To ask a question, use the chat feature on YouTube Live or comment on our Facebook feed. 
To use the YouTube live chat, you'll need to sign in, sign in as a user and set up your YouTube channel. You can find directions at www.coastalgadnr.org slash coastfest. While we wait on questions to come in, I'm going to go ahead and get started with a few of my own. How many artificial reefs have, has the DNR created and managed? Well, Charlie, we have uh, created 31 offshore artificial reefs, 15 inshore artificial reefs, and then we have 10 sites where we have oyster restoration projects uh, that we have conducted. Most of these uh, oyster restoration projects are ones that were solely for the purpose of creating fish habitat and uh, increasing fishing opportunities, but some of them have been on our public picking areas to provide opportunities for the public to harvest oysters. Why does the DNR create inshore reefs? That's a good question. So our, our inshore artificial reefs are about fishing opportunities. In, in general, we build those reefs in a place um, where there's a sandy bottom, but there may not be any structure like oysters or anything. So fish aren't naturally aggregating there. And so we build these inshore reefs as a way to um, increase locations where fishermen can fish. When creating an artificial reef, what does the DNR have to consider? So there are a number of considerations ranging from the, the, uh, the type of material, making sure that it's a suitable material for, for reefing, that it doesn't pose any environmental hazard, it's going to be stable uh, and long lasting. Uh, there's also financial considerations. Most of our materials are items that have been donated to us for the purpose of creating artificial reefs. Uh, but occasionally we have funding that we can purchase items uh, such as uh, larger ships or um, prefabricated reef materials. Uh, an example of something that we've bought recently uh, is we've got a couple of ships that we just put out at uh, CCA Reef and at uh, JY Reef. And these were some of the largest ships that we put out in the last 20 years and they were purchased uh, through funds generated by uh, the uh, habitat license plate that uh, has been ongoing for the past couple of years. And I think Tyler's pulling it up on the screen now. And this is a great opportunity for the public to help help us do our work. Um, most of the money that uh, you pay at the tag office for these tags comes directly for, to us for the use in uh, creating artificial reefs and other habitat projects. So that's a great point, Cameron. You, you end up buying that tag for your car, you get a great looking tag to go on your car. It shows a redfish and an oyster reef, but it also helps build marine habitat. It helps build artificial reefs. So that's a, that's a great point. So we've got a question here from Hannah. What kind of fish live in the reefs? That's a great question. So with, in general, you think about the offshore, thinking of offshore fish, they're, they're kind of split into two categories. You've got the bottom fish, so things like black sea bass and then some of the groupers and maybe the snappers and seasonally sheep's head will be out there. And then you've got the pelagic fish. Pelagic meaning they swim in the water column. A lot of those are migratory, so you get things like king mackerel or Spanish mackerel or cobia or barracuda swimming through. And then some of the things that we always get the questions on are things like the sharks. We have great white sharks that move through seasonally. You might see nurse sharks or stingrays. And then things that aren't fish, like mammals. It's not uncommon to see dolphins swimming around the reefs. And also another great inhabitant of the reefs are sea turtles. Sea turtles really like to get up underneath the ships and you'll see them scratching their shells up under the ship and, and they, they really enjoy the artificial reefs as, as it gives them some habitat, a place to be. All right, so we've got another question in from uh, Marianne, uh, what do you think about using sand 3D printers to make artificial reefs? Uh, so that's definitely something that could be done um, on a small scale, particularly for um, if you had a specific uh, feature that you're wanting to mimic. Um, however, it probably wouldn't be viable on a large scale like we do for a lot of our reefs. Um, it would probably be too, too cost cost prohibitive, um, but definitely you could do things with that that you wouldn't be able to do easily using other methods that we, we currently have. All right, we got a question from Robert Todd from McIntosh County Academy, the commercial fisheries class. Are there particular species of sea creatures that these new reef systems 
seem to be helping out more than others. I think the, the interesting thing is that if you, if you, like the video said, if you go uh, offshore the waters of Georgia, just anywhere and, and, and go to the bottom of the ocean, it's basically just sand. So there's very few areas where there's natural reefs. So just by putting the ships out or the tanks out or whatever we put out, it, it allows us to have a substrate for the reef to grow on. So really it benefits all fish. I don't know that it, any one fish it benefits more than others. I mean, there are very commonly, like when we have our reef balls, you'll see flounder around those and black sea bass in them. I think different fish like different shapes, but we don't build the reefs to benefit any one particular species of fish. But that's a great question. Uh, so we've got another question here from Hannah. What's the most interesting thing that you have used as a reef? Um, so probably some of the most unique things that we have out there um, are uh, our, our tanks and our, our subway cars, things that have been uh, donated through various partnerships. Uh, the Reef X program um, was a program that uh, donated a lot of um, outdated military surplus equipment like those tanks and ships to, to artificial reef programs all over the coast. And that's provided us with the opportunity to get some very long-lasting, durable material uh, that's very interesting to dive on uh, as well as providing great fish habitat. I like to see the materials, Cameron, that come out of a project like when they tore the Lanier Bridge down right by our office and we got to use the concrete from that because you get to, that sort of gets to live on into the future. And, and, and speaking of into the future, we are, we are inheriting the Navy towers, the tactical towers offshore that the Navy used to use when they were training air, the airplane pilots. They would watch the airplane pilots from these towers and they, they look like, if you've ever seen an oil rig offshore, they look like a really small oil rig. And the interesting thing is, well, those are gonna be cut down and laid on their side and then they'll get to form a reef also. So the Navy towers is a really kind of exciting material for us to get also. Uh, so we've got a question here from, uh, sorry, I'm going to mangle your first name there, so I'm just going to say Miss Jackson. Um, how is putting old boats in the ocean healthy? So we have a lot of precautions that we take in order to make it so that it's healthy. Um, we have to ensuring, be ensuring that there's no deleterious substances that are going to be left on the, the vessels, such as any petroleum substances, uh, nothing that would float away um, and um, um, we're, we're very, very strict about that. We also have requirements about having holes cut in the vessels so that there's no entrapment of uh, marine life or of divers that are going down to the reefs. And we have requirements about taking off any rails and, and ladders so that we don't have uh, increased risk of fishing gear getting entangled on the, the vessels and thereby entangling the, uh, the, the wildlife. Um, so basically when we put the, the ship down, all that's left is your, is your metal hull, uh, which is providing that substrate for the, the corals and sponges and algae to grow on. Um, so there's, there's nothing left there that should be of any harm to the environment. That's a, that's a great point, Kim. I think, I think I would like to point out that it, really this is a balancing act because we get that question all the time. Are you just putting things to dispose of in the ocean? That's certainly not what we're doing. We're, we're very selective in what type of materials that we do use. They have to be clean. They have to be stable. They have to be able to stay in one place. And, and we, we feel like the benefits outweigh any negative impacts that happen from, from putting any of this material out there. And that's really, like all of natural resource management, it's a balancing act. And we feel like that, that the, the reefs are, are far better, they're causing far more good than they are harm. So we've got a question here from Elder Young. How do these reefs affect trawling vessels in the area? So we are very careful in the selection of where our reefs are to avoid areas that uh, are uh, being used by trawlers. And most of our offshore artificial reefs have been designated as um, uh, special use zones where commercial activities are prohibited and you're only allowed to use uh, recreational gear there. Uh, so there's no overlap between the, the commercial trawlers and these reefs. Uh, we had a very extensive vetting process when we put in our, our most recent reef BSF in selecting that site to avoid 
areas that the, the trawlers are using. Um, and when we selected that site, we selected an area that already had known snags that they were avoiding already. Uh, so there was no, no uh, detriment to there. Yep. And I, all, all of those locations are on the nautical charts. They're printed on the nautical charts. You'll see the box. It says special management zone. Mm -hmm. So anybody doing a trawling work, they would yep. very easily be able to know where they are. And there's also minimum clearance requirements for them. So any ship going over has plenty of water so they won't collide with the reef. So they're, they're very well thought out. And I think they're very well placed. They're strategically placed all up and down the coastline to allow anglers to have an opportunity, no matter where they're coming from, to go fish a reef. So I think... We, we, don't, we don't have issues with trawling. So Leslie Jones has a question. It's a student question. When did you get this job? You want to start that one, Cameron? Sure, sure. So I started with DNR um, about six years ago doing part-time work, um, doing creel surveys, and have my, got my current job about three years ago. Um, and uh, have, have been really, really enjoying doing this work and really been excited about it. So I've been with DNR for 26 years and I started, I've, I've done three major jobs at DNR. One of them was a netting survey I did for about 12 years. And then for about 12 years, I'd worked in marine education and public outreach. And in the last two, almost three years, I've been doing this job. So I've done a variety of things, but it's been an exciting job. It's been a lot of fun, but we appreciate that question. DNR certainly is a great place to work. Uh, so we got a question here from Jared. How far offshore and how deep are the are most of the artificial reefs. Um, so most of our artificial reefs are in the um, 10 to 20 miles offshore range, um, ranging from about 40 feet deep to uh, about 80 feet deep. We do have some as far offshore as about 80 miles offshore, um, getting up to a depth of about 160 to 170 feet. Uh, but the majority of them are in that, that narrow band of uh, 10 to 20 miles out. So are the reefs helpful to support to sport fish to the sport fishing industry? And that's a great question. The answer would be yes, because they do provide they provide habitat for fish to be, so we have more habitat. So we like to we like to show that we're increasing habitat, which means more fish, but it's also it gives an opportunity for fishermen to have locations to fish, which is important. And then also scuba diving. Scuba diving, people don't think about scuba diving a lot off the coast of Georgia because you see our waters are very nutrient rich and dark in color. And you go to the beach and you can't see your feet and you think, well, how could you scuba dive? But when you get out past about 15 miles offshore Georgia, the water can be really clear. You get in the 20 mile range and you can have really good visibility. And it, it is patchy. It's not, it's not like going to the Caribbean and going diving, but it is, it is where you can dive, you can see. There's a, there's a small but dedicated group of coastal folks that spearfish that like to go out. And so they use our reefs for spearfishing. They're great locations to go spearfish. Can you harvest or pick oysters off inshore artificial reefs? That's a great question, Charlie. The, um, the oysters on the inshore artificial reefs are grown as fish habitat. We like to have them be fish habitat. And like you can see here, they create this sort of 3D growth pattern and they're great for um, fish, larval fish to, to be in. You'll, you'll see things like um, larval grouper that live offshore as adults spend time in these reefs. So they're perfect for that, but they're not good for eating. And the reason why is because we have dedicated public picking areas where we test water quality and you can only legally pick oysters out of a public picking area. And I also have to say that you need a fishing license to pick oysters. And I have to tell you, short of buying the marine habitat license plate, like Cameron mentioned, the other great thing you can do for conservation would be to buy a fishing license. That money from your fishing license goes directly back into managing these resources. And that's important to help us do our job. Are there natural reefs in Georgia? That's a great question also. There's, there are some natural reefs. There are places where the tectonic plates have shifted and you've got some limestone outcroppings that are exposed and where that limestone is, the, the reefs can grow. And it's a lot like the stuff growing on a ship. It's growing directly on that limestone. And that's my point of, you can't really tell the difference between a natural reef and an artificial reef. It's just what the sponges and the corals are growing on. So in Georgia, we have a really important one. Y'all go Google this one, Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary, and you learn about Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary. It's, a, it's an incredible place with, with lots of old growth things, growing sponges, corals. They have big barrel sponges that'll be like this tall. Um, 
Then there's also some smaller areas like the Sapelo Live Bottom. And then when you get further offshore, there's a couple places about 40 miles offshore. They call it the 40 mile bottom, but it's actually in 120 feet of water. There's a set off of St. Simon's called the, the Brunswick Snapper Banks. And there's some off of Savannah they refer to as the Savannah Snapper Banks. And those are great natural reefs that are offshore Georgia. Plenty of good fishing, plenty of good diving there also. What kind of animals like to hang out around the offshore artificial reefs? Uh, so there's just a wide variety of organisms that live off these uh, artificial reefs. You get all the, the invertebrates that, that grow on the reefs, the sponges, the corals, um, and then, you know, amongst those you have crustaceans um, going up to uh, some of your small, small fish that live in the little cracks and crevices in the reefs, like your, your blennies and so forth. Um, and then you get into um, other fish that are feeding off of those. Um, as a broad group, you could call them demersal fishes. That's fishes that are foraging on or near the, the bottom um, around those reefs. And that includes a lot of your game fish uh, that people go out there and, and try and catch, like your black sea bass um, and your, your snappers and groupers. Um, and then above that, uh, you get your pelagic fishes uh, that include a lot of your migratory species, like your, your billfishes um, and tuna and so forth, um, that will pass over the reefs and forage uh, along the edges of those reefs. But it's also not limited to fishes. You have uh, marine mammals that, that frequent the reefs, like your dolphins, um, and uh, sea turtles are frequently seen on the reefs, and they'll take shelter in the reefs um, and are often seen uh, uh, taking shelter, you know, under the, the, the underside of a ship or uh, some other structure where they can rest safely while sleeping. So I think Cameron's described two things. If we paint that in the big picture, he's described a marine food web, which is what we're trying to create. We're creating the entire food web around those reefs. And also this idea of habitat, this place where these animals live, we're creating habitat. So that's a great explanation of those animals, Cameron. So we have Ms. Kim Metters, which is Charlie's mom, chiming in with, what's the process of sinking a vessel? And that's a great question. When we, we already described the cleaning of the vessels and how the engines are removed and the oil's taken out of the tanks and any plastic or anything that's detrimental to the environment that might float off or, or um, all that stuff's removed. And then we take them offshore. A lot of times we have to put water or concrete in them so they have a ballast so the ship acts like a ship and can be towed out there. And then when we get it offshore, they'll open up all the valves where the engine used to bring water in. And sometimes they'll take a torch and cut a hole in them. Sometimes we'll take a pump with a large, like a fire hose, and we'll pump water into them. And the goal is to sink them and have them sit upright. And the, mainly the upright sitting is just because they look cool sitting on the bottom. But also divers like to dive on them. And they certainly, we have openings in them and it's easier for divers to dive when they're sitting upright. So it's, nowadays it's all about slow and methodical sinking of them. There was a time, and you'll see if you go to our website and look at the reef page, you'll see back in the 70s where we would actually blow up the ships and blow holes in them and it was real dramatic, but we don't do that anymore because we learned it's, it's bad for the fish and we've had some marine mammal interactions that we don't want to have. And so it's one of those things that um, we just, that's one of those, we can't do that anymore. So, but. Uh, so one other thing that would uh, be good to tie in with the process of sinking a ship, there's a lot of permitting that's involved to make sure that's that right. we're we're doing our job correctly um, and notifying all the people that need to know um, so that, you know, that any uh, boaters that are going out into the area know that something new is going out um, and uh, not to, it won't pose any sort of navigational hazard to them. Um, so we've got, you know, standing permits that we use. And then through that, we're sending out notification letters to, uh, to NOAA and the National Marine Fisheries Service and the Army Corps of Engineers um, and uh, a variety of other recipients um, that, uh, that need to know when something's going out. That's a great comment. Obviously avoiding endangered turtles or endangered mm -hmm. right whales right, or anything right. like that's really important to us. And that's one of the things that we're trying to accomplish. Uh, so we've got a question here from Hannah. Would there ever be a reason to remove a reef? Um, if we do our jobs correctly, then no, but there, there's always the possibility that a, a storm could come in um, and, and blow a, um, a ship or something into an area um, where it is sitting too shallow and could pose a navigational hazard to, to vessels. Um, 
we're very careful in our, our selection placement um, so that, uh, that, that there's plenty of water over the top of them. And the same goes for, for inshore, um, particularly with those because they're so close to our navigational channels, a little bit of movement there could put it in an area where it is causing a, a hazard to boaters. And we got another question from Ms. Kim Metter from one of her students. Do these artificial reefs attract sharks? And the answer to that would be yes. Um, a wide variety of sharks can be seen on our reefs. We see things like stingrays, Atlantic stingrays, which are in the shark family. We see commonly see nurse sharks. Um, if you've tracked the great white sharks through the OSEARCH website, you'll know that we have great whites that come in our water certain times of the year, and they certainly have been found near our reefs. I've personally been diving and come face to face with a hammerhead shark underwater, which is which was exciting for me and the shark. And um, <laughs> so there's a wide variety of sharks you can run into: bull sharks, nurse sharks, uh, tiger sharks, all sorts of sharks out there. There's about 11 or 12 species of sharks that we've documented through one of our surveys occurring in our near shore water. So we, you, you would not be uncommon to run into any of those fish. And that's all the time we have for this session of Virtual Coast Fest. We hope you've enjoyed learning about the Coastal Resources Division's mission. Tune in next time.